Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and virtually uh, meet you all here. Um, so today I'm going to talk about relativistic fluid dynamics on particle colliders and neutron star mergers. Um, you'll see more or less what I want to say um, very soon. So the first thing I want to tell you is um, something that is obvious to everybody, but you know, fluid dynamics is everywhere, right? And everywhere around it, you see the gas, you see air, you see liquids. Um, and one thing that you may ask is why? Why do we see fluid dynamics everywhere? Well, so uh, the reason is, uh, so fluid dynamics everywhere because it's, it's a very general phenomenon. It's based on conservation laws. Uh, and also in another hypothesis that happens, when it happens, is the idea of large, you have a large separation of scales. And the separation of scales here that I mean is very broadly. So imagine that you have a macroscopic scale, capital L, as you see here, and a microscopic scale, a small scale, little l here. And in general, what happens is when you take the ratio between these characteristic scales, there is a number, which is more like a field that we call the Knudsen number. And when this quantity is uh, much smaller than one, we normally call this a fluid. So we at least think that this a fluid description will be okay. Um, so there's a simplification, but that's more or less how these things work. And that's why when you try to describe, for example, hurricanes here on earth use fluid dynamics, or you wanna describe the fluid passing by a car, here you use fluid dynamics. So um, in general, what do you learn, at least in undergrad, is you know, how do you actually get the equations that describe fluid dynamics? So you use a few you know, basic principles, you use conservation of mass, use Newton's second law. Um, uh, conservation of mass is just what you see here. Whatever comes in on the surface comes out. Um, you also, in general, assume isotropy. You may also assume incompressibility here. And you end up with an equation that you can see in any textbook. It's an equation for the velocity field. So with this V here, um, uh, this P is the pressure. And uh, basically what it's telling you is how the velocity field changes in space and time. Um, this equation is interesting because it's divided into two parts, very clear, uh, very clear distinguished uh, into two parts. So the first part is the ideal fluid, okay? So here in this power counting, we would say that this is of order zero in this Knudsen number. So this is ideal fluid. So there's no viscosity being produced, uh, sorry, no, no entropy being produced. And then there's the other part, which is very important in general, which has to do with viscosity. So this eta here is what we call the shear viscosity that appears when you have a velocity going in one direction, but a gradient going in the other direction, as you see in this little figure. And of course, viscosity matters, as you can see here. So this is just a little animation. So this is a fluid without viscosity, so that's the part. And this is the viscous part. It's very different. It looks more like honey than water, OK? So in general, what you do, the left-hand side is the ideal part. The right-hand side here, the part of the viscosity, you create a way to describe it, normally using effective theory arguments. So um, these equations are very famous. They're called the Navier-Stokes equations. And they're valid in principle, strictly, when this Knudsen number is much smaller than one. Um, so you would have a very distinction, a very big distinction between the, the, the scales. And basically, you can just write the equations this way. So you have your ideal part, and then you have your viscous part. These equations were written down a long time ago. For example, Stokes here is around uh, 1845. And these equations, they look simple, right? So they look the type of equations that you should be able to solve. Uh, but it, it turns out that it's, it's, they're not so easy. Uh, this, this problem, even the standard Never Stokes thing, is notoriously hard uh, because it's a nonlinear problem. As you see, V depends on V again here. So there's a quadratic term in V. And it's a very hard problem and also to understand mathematically, especially uh, when you go to three or more dimensions. Um, there's a lot of physics that, physics that go into this. There is a discussion about turbulence. Um, and in fact, here you see Da Vinci was already sketching uh, things about turbulence 500 years ago. And also, if you're into mathematics, there is a big problem. Uh, there's a, the Millennium Prize problem from the Clay Institute that says that you know, if you're able to prove uh, what is called the global existence and smoothness of the solution of Navier Stokes equations, which basically means the following. So you start with a good initial condition, see what happens after the time is very, very long, um, if the, the solution is going to explode or not. So whether or not you prove that this is okay, or you find a counterexample, there, you get a million bucks. But it turns out that this is probably the hardest way to get a million bucks uh, nowadays. So uh, even the simple equation, uh, there are so many things to be understood.
But what we're going to talk about today here is not this simple uh, never Stokes equations. Um, I'm going to talk about the frontiers, at least some of the frontiers of fluid dynamics, okay? Fluid dynamic behavior. So the first frontier that I'm interested in is what happens when you, when your big scale, what you call macro, now is so short, so small, that is on the size, the typical size relevant for nuclear and particle physics. And what I mean by that, is as, a, as you see, when I'm talking about having ion collisions, we'll talk about fluids that um, are related to the size of the nucleus. And you see here, the scale going from the atom to the nucleus and even more extreme things that happens and you can actually see at least indications of fluid-like behavior for systems the size of a proton. That is, you know, five orders of magnitude smaller than an atom. So could this be a liquid? The other frontier, now we're going to something much bigger, is what happens uh, when you have fluid dynamics in very strong gravitational and electromagnetic fields. For example, as a neutron star merges, that you, all, you all have seen many animations before, you have these two neutron stars, they come, they collide, a lot of uh, uh, things going on, um, you have gravitational waves being emitted and so forth. So those are the frontiers that I'm interested in in this talk. And you see that they are related. So um, talking about neutron stars and very dense matter, the first thing I have to uh, come to is quantum chromodynamics. Quantum chromodynamics, quantum chromodynamics is the fundamental theory of strong interactions. It's a non-abelian gauge theory. This means that just not, you know, just you have your interactions between quarks like your fermions uh, with the gluons, but the gluons interact with themselves. That's the big difference um, between uh, QCD and QED. And this difference appears here in the coupling. So if you if quarks try to interact or gluons try to interact and the momentum exchange in these reactions is very, very large, the coupling is very small. On the other hand, there's another limit, but the coupling is not small and new phenomena appear, new non-perturbative phenomena appear. As you can see here, this is an old, but very nice still simulation uh, of the QCD vacuum. So for the specialists, this is just pure glue. And you see all these fluctuations. So the QCD vacuum is very interesting. There's a lot of stuff um, going on. And there are many different phenomena. For example, color confinement. These particles have color, but color in the end does not appear um, as a physical thing. So there's a strong complex phenomenon, quarks and gluons, these fundamental parts of QCD, in general, they're really never truly free. But those are the building blocks of matter um, as we know it. So there are a few things that we know. Um, I'm interested here in QCD uh, in the limit where you have temperature. So you have a hot chunk of QCD matter. Um, and also it will be dense at some point here. But uh, one of the things that we actually understand is uh, what happens to the quark gluon plot or the quark gluon system, in this case, in equilibrium. And I write here the quark gluon plasma because what happens is if the temperature is very, very large, larger than the typical mass of the sort of uh, states that appear like pions and protons. Uh, it's expected that the system now is not really described by protons or pions, but it's described by quarks and gluons. And at least in the equilibrium, so you have a system, you have a box, and um, at least in the equilibrium, this system can be understood. So you have, um, you can understand what happens in the QCD phase transition, the early universe, and now we understand this as a crossover. So there's no real phase transition can go from hadrons like pions and protons to the quarks and gluons uh, that appear at much larger temperatures here. So this is known. So this is computed non-perturbatively non using lattice QCD simulations. And this is something that we know. If anybody asks you on the street, what is the pressure of QCD in equilibrium? Boom, that's the answer. But this is only the case if the number of protons and antiprotons is the same. The moment that you have more protons than antiprotons or more matter than antimatter, that's not the case. We don't know really how to compute these things, even in equilibrium. So, but how would you even study the properties of QCD out of equilibrium? Well, in order to do that, this is an idea that comes um, basically from T.D. Lee in 1975. The idea is that to be very different than particle physics. Here, uh, so particle physics likes to put a, put a lot of energy in a uh, small region of space time. So here the point in order to understand the QCD vacuum and how the temperature changes, you put a lot of energy in a region that is not so small and see how the energy distributes or flows uh, over space time. So that's how you go from the zero temperature case here to things that you see now in colliders like the LHC. So this is the Atlas experiment. And this is one of the heavy ion events 
uh, that we're going to talk about now and then try to produce and see what happens to QCD at finite temperature. So uh, heavy ion collisions, they, some people say that it's like a little big bang. And, and the, the point of this experiment is the following is this is the way to study non equilibrium hot QCD phenomena in the lab. And what, what happens is that you um, send this uh, nuclei, for example, large nuclei like gold or lead, they come very, very fast, nearly at the speed of light. That's why they look like pancakes. They collide. The energy is very, very large here. The temperature initially is very large, so large that now quarks and gluons are the degrees of freedom of the system. As any other system, um, this, this thing starts to uh, evolve. And as it evolves, the temperature cools down. As it, uh, as it cools down, these hadrons appear again, protons and pions, as you can see, and the imagine the detector. What has been understood in the last 20 years is that this QGP, this matter formed in these collisions, is the hottest, the densest, and the smallest, most perfect fluid ever known. And there are many things that are going to this. I'm going to just tell you the one that I'm interested in for this talk, which is this nearly perfect fluidity property of the QGP, which is, which is really an emergent property, property of QCD in the sense that if you just look at the QCD Lagrangian, you have no idea that this thing would look like a fluid. But um, every single uh, experimental data point and, and any phenomenological analysis actually tell you that um, the, Q, the quark gluon plasma, this hot system of QCD matter behaves like a strongly coupled uh, liquid where the shear viscosity divided by the entropy density in my units here, these are natural units. Uh, this is a, a, a dimensionless number. It's a number between 0 0.05 and 0 0.2. There's some uncertainty here. I'm gonna talk about this soon. But um, basically this is obtained by comparing data. So this data here suffice to say that this is just telling you how these particles are emitted after the two heavy ions collide. So we do an analysis understanding how this thing uh, works and compare to models. And the models, all the models uh, use relativistic hydrodynamics. So they use equations of motion for a fluid that is moving basically at the speed of light. And things like the energy density of the system, they look like this. So um, why is this uh, a very interesting and extreme fluid? Um, so if you try to put it together, what happens to this quantity, this eta, the shear viscosity divided by the entropy density, as a function of some parameter, in this case, a temperature, what do you see for the quark gluon plasma, this number is around, as I said, 0 0.05, 0 0.2. So there is some uncertainty band here. We can talk about more, um, more about that later. But if you compare to other you know, standard substances, for example, like water that we normally associate with a fluid, you see that this quantity is much uh, smaller for the quark gluon plasma. Given all the uncertainties that we know, and there are many about what happens to the quark gluon plasma, I think it's safe to say that uh, at least compared to water and some other substances here, the quark gluon plasma is supposed to have a very small shear viscosity to entropy density ratio. And this has to be understood. Um, one thing that you could imagine is the following. Wait, so you, you made uh, your initial original point is that how fluid dynamics appears is that you should have a very big separation of scales between what you call large, like a typical distance within which you know, the energy density changes and things like that, or the flow velocity changes, and some microscopic scale. How do you know that this system that is formed in heavy ion collision that is so small, I mean, nuclei, is, you know, nuclei are you know, small things. How do you know that this looks like a fluid? And does it even make sense that it should be a fluid? So this is what we call the unreasonable reflectiveness of hydrodynamics and heavy ion collisions. Um, and, and, and the idea is the following. Um, we have to start talking about how you talk or describe uh, fluid dynamics in relativity. And um, the first thing you should remember is, so when I was talking about the Navier-Stokes equations, I had an equation. I used base, uh, basic uh, conservation laws to understand how the velocity field changed with space and time. So here in relativity, things are a little bit more complicated, but the idea is the same. You have conservation laws here, conservation of energy momentum, conservation of, of baryon number, like the number of protons uh, minus the number of antiprotons. And that's what this symbol here means. So uh, energy momentum is conserved. That's what this equation means. But now the variable is more complicated than just a little velocity. 
So the variable here is this thing called TMU, nu, the energy momentum tensor, that it basically tell, tells you everything that is going on with the energy and the momentum in the system. So you have the energy density, the flux of energy, where the energy is going, where the momentum is going. So you can have shear stress, shear stress, pressure, just like you would see in standard normal relativistic system. But now, instead of having I and J's, I have uh, mu and nu. Um, so, and then this is the basic object, the energy momentum tensor. Again, the reasoning is the same. You separate this into an ideal part of this first part here that does not produce entropy and the rest. The rest is the dissipative part that you try to make sense of using some perturbative scheme, something related, for example, to this idea of the Knudsen number that I introduced in the first slides. Okay, so let's think about heavy ion collisions. Right. So how, how can all these things work in those extreme conditions? Well, at first, you know, this is before 2010, it seemed that hydrodynamics, you know, really made sense. It was really justifiable, justifiable because the idea at the time was that, for example, if you were to see what is the energy density, uh, this is the energy density, uh, Fermi cubed here, this is the volume, as a function of X and Y. So this is the plane within which the, the matter was formed. So imagine that the heavy ions were coming like this in the Z direction and X, Y is this plane that I'm plotting here. And the idea was that this matter, this quark gluon plasma um, was really something smooth, right? So that's, that's what the models were at the time. And um, this is really an idea of near equilibrium dynamics. Um, and you could try to estimate, you know, what happens to the Knudsen number there. So for example, the macroscopic distances like the gradients of the energy here, um, let me call this one over capital L. And the micro scale here, let's just say that is one over the temperature. Um, if you actually put the numbers and the temperature here is um, larger than the, the, the mass of a pion, larger than 150 MeV in natural units, uh, if you actually work out, you see the Knudsen number is like 0 0.1. So it makes sense. It looks like you could have, it is conceivable that fluid dynamics makes sense at scales of the size of a large nucleus, like gold or lead. However, reality is much more complicated because of course, uh, you know, even though you have your protons and neutrons in the nucleus, they are not static. And in fact, they are not little balls that, that collide. They're much more than that. I mean, those are quantum mechanical, highly quantum mechanical objects and they're unavoidable quantum fluctuations. And in fact, what you actually see in realistic modeling is that the energy density, the initial thing that you see after the system, system collides has very large gradients, okay? So for example, this is a, one of the, what we think is realistic uh, type of energy density now. You see that the gradients are very, very large. If the gradients are large, it means that what you thought was the Knudsen number is actually not small. And if you try to compute this by any estimate, you see that even in large systems, the Knudsen number is not really small, it's large. So you start to wonder, how come? How come that, you know, when I try to understand this as a fluid and I do simulations using fluid dynamics and it seems to work because it describes the data, how, how does it work? There is a paradox here. The paradox is that the Knudsen number, this thing that I use to characterize what a fluid is or where fluid dynamics emerges, the Knudsen number is large but somehow hydro still works, this hydrodynamic thing still works. This issue must be understood. And of course, as a theorist, uh, I was already very worried about that um, around that time. What the experimentalists did, um, they're much smarter than us. They decided to reduce the system size instead of having a, a big nucleus. Okay, let's collide smaller systems. For example, protons with a gold nucleus, deuterons with a gold nucleus, or even helium uh, nucleus with a gold nucleus. So here, these are just models to see how much smaller the system is. For a big lad nucleus, the radius will be, you know, six Fermi or something like that. While here you see the system is very small, it's around in a one or two Fermi. So I decreased the big scale by at least a factor of four or three. So should hydrodynamics still work? Well, it turns out that it still does. So if you try to compute the same observable before that we use to say that this is a fluid because we can describe it the data, we can use relativistic fluid dynamics and it makes sense. If you do that for these reduced systems as you keep decreasing the system and even you go to proton-proton, 
the smallest thing that you can do, this observable is still there and it still makes sense um, if you compare fluid dynamics to data. This is a big deal and it's a big puzzle because now what we actually see is that evidence, we have evidence of collective behavior at scales of the size of the proton itself. That's one Fermi, that's 10 to the minus 15 meters. How does li this liquid-like behavior emerge from QCD? How come that if you just look at how these fundamental interactions between quarks and gluons, how can you just look at that and say, well, okay, that's obviously a fluid. <laughs> this is one of the biggest deals um, in this field and we still um, don't know how to answer that. That's a challenge. In fact, there are so many challenges. There are many challenges um, that appeared in QCD. Um, so this is the theory of, you know, in a formal way, you can see there's a many body, non-abelian gauge theory at finite temperature and density. But there are also many challenges to the foundations of fluid dynamics itself. Because for example, how can you really understand this liquid-like behavior at the size of a proton? So what is the separation of scales, right? So in fact, you could say in a more broad, uh, way, what happens to a fluid as you transition from a small Knudsen number limit, something that is very close, very nice behaved, to something uh, where the Knudsen number is large of order one, like I said, that it could happen in heavy ions. And you can do even better. If you like math, you can also think about this. Um, if you try to describe your dissipative part, how this system generates entropy using a series, um, some effective description, would this series converge? If you try to put more and more terms, does it make sense? Or was it going to be like you normally see in quantum field theory that most of the theories, the, the series that appear are asymptotic, right? So in fact, they diverge, but you have to resum. Great. If you have to resum, what does it mean? What are these new non perturbative terms that would appear in fluid dynamics itself? Um, those are very big questions. Um, I have to say that question number one, we really don't know um, how to answer. Question number two, we can do in the relativistic regime for very, very, very simplified systems, very simple systems that are still not like the quark one plasma that's very complicated. And question number three, we have a much better understanding in the relativistic regime. We see what happens when you try to put more and more terms in this Knudsen series to define what is dissipation in the relativistic regime. And we actually find if the system that is expanding very, very fast, the series diverges, okay? So we actually have to worry and think about uh, resummations. So how do you deal with the divergent series? And actually, if you think about it, how do you deal with fluid dynamics? If fluid dynamics was somehow based on the idea that these corrections will be small, what do you do when they are not small anymore, when they're actually large? So there are many things that go into this. Um, and this is the idea that you now we're now going from paradox to paradigm um, because you could say as the system gets far and far from equilibrium, as it seems to be the case that we have to think about that for the quark one plasma for this crazy fluid, is there some universal behavior that appear even far from equilibrium? Um, and in fact, there seems to be something like that. Um, there's an idea, uh, it goes by the name of hydrodynamic attractors. Um, it started more or less in 2015 and it has become a big deal in, in this field. And the idea is the following. Um, it's basically, uh, this is a name for the following idea that somehow um, describes the following idea. This system, um, even though the gradients are large, even though it's far from equilibrium, right? So. By the standard reasoning, you would say that this has nothing, it should not even be a fluid. The gradients are large, but somehow this system still behaves as a fluid. And uh, this can be explained in this cartoon. The idea is the following. So imagine that you have all the dissipative part. So for those that um, have worked with fluid dynamics, so these are the dissipative uh, currents here, the shear stress, the bulk viscosity. So imagine that you put everything that is dissipative here and you plot this as a function of one over this Knudsen number in the sense that equilibrium is here, okay? In equilibrium, this Knudsen number is zero. So there are no really no, no gradients and uh, it's very far away here. While on the other hand here, the, close to the origin, the system is very, very far from equilibrium because the Knudsen number is small, the gradients are large 
So this, that's why, you know, we drew all these, these different fluctuations. So in general, you would expect, okay, so if the system is far from equilibrium, you know, there, there, I may need many, many new observables to try to characterize its state. But what, at least what we see in the models that we can compute is the following, that that is not true. Even though the system is far from equilibrium, there is, that's the idea of the attractor, is some universal behavior far from equilibrium. So that's this curve, okay, that the system actually becomes very simple even though the gradients are still large. So this has been supported by many types of calculation. And now the idea is to see how this could actually appear in realistic models uh, for the quark one plasma. But at least in the models that we can compute, we can see that that's actually the case. So we can see some universal hydrodynamic-like behavior, even though you're very far from equilibrium. So this surprising effectiveness of fluid dynamics in heavy ion collisions it's now attached to the ideas of hydrodynamic attractors. This is the leading uh, hydrodynamic-like justification for the collective phenomena observed in these ultra-relativistic heavy ion collisions. But what are the consequences of these ideas to other areas of physics? So for example, there are other areas you can do, for example, with cold atoms. You can, ob can you observe such attractors in other rapidly expanding um, many body systems far from equilibrium? This would be an interesting question that I think could be explored uh, now. I mean, there are new techniques that could be used to try to understand that in other areas of physics. And that's where I think um, um, a lot of the knowledge that has been developed for heavy ion collisions can spread through other areas. Okay, so um, this is um, just to more or less uh, get an idea of what happens to fluid dynamics this is a bird's eye view on this problem. So you can see here, so I, I put this like, fluid here in a very generic way. And I tried to plot this in different limits as a function of velocity of, you know, of your fluid. So here is the speed of light. That's where a relativistic fluid is. So here you see heavy ion collisions. They're all relativistic. And what I did here is I decreased the system. So I started with a very big nucleus and it started to go down all the way to a little proton. And the other axis here is quantumness or how important H bar is. So daily life is here, the normal you know, simulation that you see here for this car. And uh, for the quantumness, you know, if you have um, something that is very quantum, like a Bose-Einstein condensate I would put here, in heavy ion collisions, as the system becomes very small, you could put, um, uh, you'd have something that is relativistic and also quantum. Also, if you have uh, things like spin or anomalies in your fluid, it would appear here very quantum. And uh, since 2017, a new axis appeared uh, in this little schematic. Um, it has to do with gravity. Because now we can not only probe things that are, in a sense, relativistic, um, but also we want to see what happens when you put very strong fields, uh, for example, gravitational fields, and also strong, very strong electromagnetic fields. And that'll be the idea of neutron sort breakers that I'm going to talk about for the rest of this talk. So um, what about the properties of this matter in neutron stars, right? Imagine that you, a neutron star is something very, very dense. Um, so can we just sit down and calculate? I mean, QCD is there, it's been there since 1973. One should be able to compute things. Um, but unfortunately, the properties of the very uh, extreme uh, a very high uh, density uh, matter in neutron stars remains unknown, okay? And um, so basically, if you try to do, you know, if you're a condensed matter physicist, um, you like to create a phase diagram. So every point here is a point in equilibrium. So here, my parameters are temperature and in this case, net baryon density. So think about this as the, basically the number of protons minus the number of antiprotons. So for heavy ion collisions at very large energies at the LHC, we are here. Basically, you have the same number of protons and antiprotons, but you have very large temperatures. As you go towards the early universe, so you're really on top of these axes here, and the temperature is very, very, very large, all the way up. And um, so now what are we doing? You have ion collisions trying to go this way to produce something that is not as hot, but is denser. And there are many things that could show up. For example, there could be a critical point. There could be, a, and this will be followed by a first order transition line here between when you go from pions and protons to quarks and gluons. 
The only part that we actually understand really uh, directly from QCD, from first principles is this, this very high temperature part here. In fact, a very large part of the QCD phase diagram is unknown, okay? And um, there, you must use other sources to understand this high density part. Uh, so for example, you have ion collisions, this has been done. People have been trying to understand what happens as the system gets colder and denser. So more protons and antiprotons here. And now with neutron star mergers, you need to understand or have a model to what happens to the equation of state um, of this QCD matter at the core of a neutron star. As you go towards the edges, things get much better. And at least within, you know, up to two times the standard set, the, the standard density of a nucleus, things are much better understood. While as you go towards the core where the system is very, very dense, um, we really don't understand what's going on there. But um, there are already simulations using our, uh, general relativistic uh, hydrodynamics without viscosity. And this, I'm gonna get to this point soon, where they try to bridge to go, basically you're going from heavy ions to neutron stars. And I think this connection is becoming much more obvious now uh, and is being explored by many groups. Okay, so um, since 2017, we have seen neutron star mergers, we've seen gravitational waves, we've seen electromagnetic signals from neutron star mergers. And now the idea is to see how uh, one can probe this ultra dense matter that appears at the core of the star and try to finally understand what are its properties for example, using gravitational waves. So how does a chunk of hot QCD or not even necessarily hot, but very dense matter uh, flow under very strong gravitational fields? So here you see some snapshots of a simulation. So these are the two neutron stars getting close together. So they start to uh, spiral and then at some point they merge and note, note the time scale here. So this time scale that's the typical time scale within which these gravitational waves are produced. This is 10 milliseconds. So the system formed is very dense and, and hot, much hotter than an isolated cold neutron star. And there are many things going on here. People are thinking about whether there could be new phase transitions. Um, and what I'm interested in here is to understand what happens to fluids. What are the, I really want to understand the foundations of fluid dynamics under extreme conditions. In this case, the presence of very strong gravitational fields. How does this fluid flow um, once space-time itself is curved? And it's very interesting uh, to give this talk here at uh, Washington State University because uh, Matt here was uh, really did a seminal work trying to understand these effects in neutron star mergers already in 2004. And there are other papers going on in 2017 and 2018. And I think what I'm gonna talk about uh, towards the end of this talk, I think will be very relevant to understand this type of problem. So in fact, in this paper in 2004, uh, they were concerned among many other things to so the properties of this hypermassive remnants. So after the nuclear stars collide, they form this thing that is still in principle, not a black hole. And it's still very massive, very hot and is rotating. It has differential rotation, has temperature, it has electromagnetic fields, it has everything. It's a full laboratory of the universe there. And there are many interesting effects that they discuss. For example, um, viscosity, if the system had viscosity and magnetic fields could actually affect this differentially rotating uh, big uh, hypermassive uh, remnant and actually slow down until you know, it tries to create a core that is you know, solidly um, uh, moving and maybe expelling some stuff um, afterwards. Um, so there are many ways to understand this. There is uh, at this point an affected shear viscosity driven by local uh, magnetohydro uh, turbulence. And very recently, Shibata and Kiyuchi, for example, they used a, a, a simplified model for what happens in a viscous system here. Imagine that the matter now is viscous. And um, what they try to understand is what, what is the difference in the shape and what happens to the, um, the whole matter here. So for example, um, so the, here you have two simulations, one with this effective viscosity, the other one without. Um, so this is the one without, you see that uh, even after some, quite some time, you still see some details in the shape of, of the system here. This is the density. But uh, once you put some viscosity, right, the system becomes very homogeneous and a lot of these anisotropies go away. And this, at least according to them, is supposed to make a difference uh, for the gravitational wave formed within this merger uh, uh, period. 
So um, other people um, started thinking about this too. So for example, in this paper by Alfred et al, they uh, tried to understand not just what shear viscosity, but bulk viscosity, how bulk viscosity could affect uh, the, uh, basically the matter in neutron stars. So bulk viscosity, different than the shear that I talked about before, bulk viscosity has to do with this, this sort of radial expansion here. Um, and according to their simulations, uh, so basically they showed, or well, they argued that uh, depending on the equation of state, so for example, you have, if you have low densities, um, there is also a stigma regarding what happens to neutrinos in this matter. And if the oscillations that happen in this matter are, have high frequencies, they uh, uh, basically argue that bulk viscosity, so a new source of dissipation, should be relevant for neutron star mergers, in this case, bulk viscous damping. And, and this comes about because there are indeed significant temperature, density, and fluid velocity variations within the star. So this is the temperature, and this is the density. So um, rho zero is the standard nuclear saturation density, the density of the nucleus here. And as you go, um, and you can see what happens as you get denser and denser. So in their conclusion is that besides other effects, bulk viscosity should also be included in these simulations. However, this requires to actually go to this and really talk about viscosity in a consistent way. This requires a formulation of these relativistic viscous fluids that is actually really consistent with relativity. Because now you have to simulate, put in a code that has Einstein's equations, fluid dynamics, and see what happens. And as any good theoretical physicist, the first thing you do, you look at Landau Lifshitz. So Landau is here. And if you actually look at that, you see that Landau discusses what happens to a fluid uh, when it becomes viscous. So you, again, you have your ideal part. So this is the energy density, this is the pressure. And this, for example, for the case of bulk viscosity, there is a contribution. This part produces entropy, right? Of course, the conservation law is still there. You still have conservation of energy momentum as always. However, it was not known at the time when Eckert, you see the date, 1940, and then Landau around the 50s, it was not known that this theory, even though it's supposed to be a relativistic system, this theory is a causal. It means that causality is violated. There's no, as I put here, you know, um, pictorially here, there's no really relation between cause and effect. And for those that actually work on this, the idea is that this, the initial value uh, problem is not really well posed for these standard equations that you can find, for example, in Landau Lifshitz. And the reason for this is very obvious um, afterwards. If, if you actually you know, dig down and see what happens here, is that these are, in general, if you actually look at the structure of the equations, they're just nonlinear, very nonlinear, diffusion equations. So here you have one time derivative and two spatial derivatives. This cannot really be good with relativity. You should have the same number, at least the same number of space and time derivatives. Also, you see, um, you can also show that this system is unstable. Even the very equilibrium, standard global equilibrium for these equations, it predicts it's, that it's unstable, which is crazy. So these equations are no good. Um, we cannot solve it without making any modifications. So causality is a fundamental uh, property of relativity. So you see Einstein here in 1905. And um, this, the only concept that I need from you here is the standard idea of causality that you saw in undergrad that you know if you have a point in space time, so this point can only affect uh, whatever it's going on here in this future light cone, as you see in this cone. And this point can only be affected by whatever happened in this past light cone. That's the standard thing that you see in relativity in flat space time. That's what most people see in undergrad. However, um, Einstein went further. So in 10 years, you see that he looked uh, pretty different. Um, so in 19, 1915, now we have, you know, for 100 years, a general relativity. And then things are different. Um, so now we have Einstein's equations. And these are complicated things with many tensors and many things. But the only point that you need to know here is that you relate geometry of space time to the properties of matter. So this, the same team you knew, the thing that gave you the distribution of energy momentum in your system actually appears uh, to define uh, what geometry is. And geometry tells matter how to move. So that's uh, the little schematic thing is that if you have a mass that distorts space-time, as you can see here, this is the standard uh, thing to talk about GR. Uh, GR is this, 
but this is what we present. Um, and causality, actually, of course, is an essential property of general relativity itself. Um, so in fact, once you have your curved space time, what you thought about about your cone, your normal light cone is a very nice little cone. Once space time itself is curved, the cone gets distorted. So if you have a little point here that you want to understand what happened to it, um, the part that is, could be causally related to it, now because of general relativity is kind of a distorted cone because space time itself is curved. So that makes things much more complicated to try to understand what happens to causality in a system in general relativity. Another property that is very important and it made a big difference um, when it comes to uh, understanding these equations in fluid dynamics is the idea of well-posedness. And uh, very broadly, the only thing I want you to, to see from this slide is that um, it's good when the, the system of equations, the partial differential equation that you're solving is well-posed. And it's basically the idea is that given some initial data that you wanna solve, um, the system is well, if the system is well-posed, the solution exists. Okay, so you don't, you're not going to waste your time trying to do numerics because you know a solution should exist. The solution is unique and the solution depends continuously on initial data. So if you change initial data a little bit, the solution will change as well. So those are very simple, but very powerful requirements that a standard physical theory should have. General relativity, for example, of course, has these properties. However, when it, comes, when it comes to viscous fluids in general relativity, just the little word viscous make a big difference. And in fact, has been a challenge for basically 80 years since Eckert started this whole thing in 1940. So the challenge is that you have to show that the solutions of your whole system that includes Einstein's equations, fluid dynamics with all the conservation laws, all the viscosity and everything else uh, is a well-posed system. So, you can solve it, has a solution, go to the computer and understand everything about it. Um, but it's also, of course, it's causal. So it's a fundamental property of general relativity is preserved in this full nonlinear regime, which is probed by the mergers, right? The gravitational field is very strong. Matter gets out of equilibrium. So it's, it's a complicated problem. And that's why it took so long to be understood. Um, so why is this so hard to understand? and how to, to, to find, why did it take you know, so long to understand these equations? Well, because Einstein and fluid equations are highly nonlinear, okay? So that makes things very hard. Current approaches are either a-causal or not known to have a well-posed initial value problem. So that's an issue. And in fact, the consistent formulation of viscous fluids in general relativity uh, has been an open problem in physics and mathematics for 80 years. But now, um, I believe we, um, we finally have solved this. And the idea is the following. So this goes um, into a bunch of papers. So these are uh, some papers that um, uh, we, I started with my collaborators in 2018, 2019. And there is a big one with all the details, many, many, many details now in um, 2020. Um, Pavel Kovtun also made a, made a very big contribution towards understanding the, the physics of this. And um, the basic idea is the following. Uh, in equilibrium, just think about the system in equilibrium, right? So you should always be able to talk about what is the distribution of energy and momentum, what happens to your baryons and your particles in the system. So these things, these are uh, these fields, which are actually really expectation values of quantum operators that you define your quantum field theory. So these things are always well defined. You know, this, these things are fine. However, in equilibrium, you can always express these quantities in terms of a temperature, a chemical potential, and a flow velocity, if you are in equilibrium, like this little cup of coffee here. And the mapping is well-defined. So if you're in equilibrium, you can go from here to the stuff that really exists, to these things that you uh, um, understand, temperature, chemical potential, and flow velocity. However, what happens when you're really out of equilibrium? When you're really out of equilibrium, of course, the energy momentum tensor the current of baryons, those are still well-defined. They, you know, they come from expectation values of operators. They make sense. However, when you are in very out of equilibrium scenarios, for example, this is a, a figure from a simulation that uh, Matt is involved in here from 2020. You, know, you have your neutron stars that collide and there's all sorts of things going on here. System is out of equilibrium, the magnetic field and all these things. Um, it has been known since Eckert and Lindell that even though these operators, or these quantities are well-defined, 
the way you break them into pieces and define what is temperature, chemical potential, flow velocity, there are many, many different ways to do this. And in fact, Eckert and Landau introduced two different ways already nearly 80 years ago. So the approach um, that was done in these papers that I think really uh, solved the problem is that we see this from an effective theory perspective. perspective. So the idea is uh, these uh, quantities, the energy momentum tensor and the, the, the current, they, if in an effective theory, you should try to describe them in terms of these variables, the temperature, the chemical potential, and the flow velocity. But as in any good effective theory, you should write down all the possible terms that can appear at a given order in your expansion. In this case, the expansion is that Knudsen uh, number expansion that I talked about, um, counting the number of derivatives, just like you normally do in an effective field theory. Uh, so you write down all the most general things compared with the symmetries and new things appear. So um, interestingly enough, um, since you know, it took like 80 years to actually do this this way, but now we see many things that were hidden before. For example, we see that causality predicts there are novel out of equilibrium corrections that appear just because of relativity that were not there before we didn't know. For example, local co-moving observers, observers that are following the fluid motion, they actually must see a non-equilibrium piece of the energy density and also an energy flux, okay? So this is in fact, um, uh, is completely the opposite of what Landau, Eckert and many others assumed over the years. So now we understand it actually comes really from relativity and causality itself. And even better, this new approach, this new way to think about it actually really naturally led us to actually a proof of causality and well posing in general relativity. So that means that what now we understand how to actually formulate viscous fluids in a full general relativity scenario. And this appears here. Um, so those are the works. So of course, I'm not gonna assume that you're gonna read or understand or any of these theorems that are sh shown here. This is just to impress you and to tell you that this is mathematically rigorous. So there are three fundamental theorems that actually prove this one proves causality. This one proves that the system is hyperbolic. So for those that actually work with GR, we prove that this is strongly hyperbolic. And the third proves that the system is stable. And this is what we are calling here uh, general relativistic fluid dynamics. And now I think we can actually really put it together, gravitation in the famous uh, Thorn, uh, uh, Ms. and Thorn Wheeler book here with fluid dynamics and many other things can appear, but now in the relativistic regime. So uh, for my conclusions, or oh, sorry, so there are some consequences of this um, that I can talk about later, but let me just finish uh, with my conclusions here. I can go back there if you want. Um, there are many consequences coming from this new theory. But uh, what I tried to show to you today here is that the quark one plasma formed the heavy ions really forces us to explore relativistic fluids far from equilibrium. So we have to understand what that thing even means. A uh, new understanding about the emergence of fluid dynamics appeared under extreme conditions. And this goes with this name of hydrodynamic attractors. It would be nice to see what happens in other fields. Um, there are many connections between nuclear physics, uh, astrophysics, cosmology, and applied mathematics that this type of work um, naturally you know, you know, give you. So we're trying to explore these different connections. For example, there's gonna be interesting for to understand what happens to viscosity in the early universe, uh, where the, the universe is still expanding very fast. And I believe this new theory solves really this 80 year old problem. And I hope that it will pave the way for describing really for the first time in a consistent manner how viscous effects or dissipative phenomena occur in general relativity, especially in neutron star mergers. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So do we have any questions? If you have questions, you can raise your hand, speak out or post them in the chat or the discussion forum. All right, well, people think I have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, so how hard is this to implement? I mean, you, you sort of, it looks really simple. You, you just have to write a gradient expansion, presumably put all the terms in that are consistent with symmetries and covariance and uh, it pops out. Then mm -hmm. you go, go to town numerically on it. 
or are there subtleties in the in the like with field theories where you have to work out the power counting and figure out how things work out that very carefully that way? Yeah, so I believe it's more like the latter in the sense that um, that's the whole point that it took two years for us. So once we had the initial idea and saw that it worked in a simple problem, we tried to do the full thing, including, for example, shear viscosity, thermal connectivity, bulk viscosity. We put everything together. Um, and that was the big work that we did, um, proving all these things. For example, proving that the system is strongly hyperbolic. So in this sense, it is as well-defined and good to solve as any other thing that you can possibly imagine in general relativity. So it should be able to be solved. I mean, one should be able to solve it, yes. So of course, solving GR just by itself <laughs> without even you know, any, you know, just even like right. the perfect fluid case is a very complicated numerical thing, but there were many steps right, that they had to go through. So for example, we have known that GR has the properties that we just proved here since the 50s. Right. Um, so, you know, and now it took, you know, many years, but now we understand that once you can actually do viscous fluids in this way. Um, so it should be amenable for uh, really numerical computation. So you can define the initial value problem and solve. And I really look forward to seeing the specialists that actually solve license equations already, um, seeing what you know, the new phenomena would be when you put, you know, this book with this. But are there subtleties with uh, the, convert, the power counting? As far as I can tell, no. Okay. I mean, it, turns... it's the subtlety, I mean, in a sense, there was a, an 80 year old subtlety that um, Lendl and, and Eckert and many others, they thought they actually had the most general expression, right? I mean, they're, of course, they're not crazy. They thought about it, but the issue is that they made an implicit assumption the implicit assumption, for example, was one of these that I said, that the energy density seen by the local observer is the same as in equilibrium, mm -hmm. okay? Because that's the case in an ideal fluid. So this is really true for an ideal fluid. But for a viscous fluid, especially in relativity, we don't know if that has to be true. And that was, in a sense, one of the key things. The other thing, it was a much better understanding of what happens to the entropy or the production of entropy uh, in a relativistic system. So there are several uh, conceptual things, and that is the part where the power counting makes a big difference. And that was not understood before, and now it is. How you can actually, so one of the things that I didn't say, but it comes from here, is that uh, this system is viscous, and of course, entropy is being produced, and the production of entropy is positive definite. That is what, is, what is this we're looking at right now? Um, this no uh, no no on the bottom right oh oh this is just a, a simulation of something that will become turbulent at some point uh yeah i just this is one of those things you get from the internet okay you don't know the details yeah no no i, I certainly don't yeah it certainly has nothing to do with the questions that i saw <laughs> i just wanted to see i mean one of the consequences that we're very interested in is to you know actually think about relativistic turbulence because now we you know we understand what the equations are uh, and I believe that those should be the equations that people should use um, to start thinking about turbulence in this scenario, relativistic turbulence. Any questions from other people? I guess going along the lines of that, um, uh, you've mentioned that you, uh, uh, you, you're looking at higher temperatures uh, when looking at the, the, the sort of fluid dynamics uh, for QCD. And I'm wondering how, um, how much does turbulence play an effect in uh, once, higher once you reach much higher temperatures? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the system, right? I mean, for at least for the neutron star mergers, um, it's expected that some form of turbulence appears. Um, I'm not the specialist when it comes to that in neutral star mergers. I can tell you about heavy ion collisions. Um, in heavy ion collisions, um, you would expect that something interesting like that could show up, but there, there is a difference. Um, heavy ion collisions expand extremely fast. Um, and that in general um, would have an effect to sort of kill, um, or at least as far as we can tell in our simulations, we don't see any, um, anything that looks like turbulent matter. Um, 
So at least in heavy ion collisions, we don't see um, how turbulence you know, would make a difference yet. But in neutral storm mergers, as far as I can tell, or as far as I understand, uh, it's supposed to, to appear related to magnetohydro and some other things. But at least there, there is some form of turbulence uh, showing up. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm very curious about taking the hydro into really small systems and sort of what's the smallest you can probe because I mean it's easy to easier to simulate small systems. I'm thinking cold atoms now. I mean yes, the, the, the cold atoms nucleus is a droplet of stuff. Um, do you have any insights for the non-relativistic theory? Is is rel is the relativistic aspect important for this or? Is that just for the formulation? That's a very good question. No, that's a very good question. In fact, um, so one of the things that I didn't tell you, but I could, I, I have you in the backup slide. So because like fact, the, the unitary Fermi gas has this extremely low entropy to, uh, you know, viscosity to entropy ratio exactly. as well. And so exactly. Um, so it's it's interesting because relativity. Um, so for the new progress that we have regarding these series, and you know, as you decrease the system, you expect that these higher order terms in your expansion become more and more important. And then you have to take into consideration and see, oh, what happens to the series? Does the series converge? Does it diverge? In this, I mean, it's not a new problem. I mean, people have been thinking about this since, you know, basically Boltzmann and very famous people in kinetic theory like Grad, they have been thinking about what happens to a system as it gets, you know, as you keep changing this Knudsen number and things like that. No relativistic is hard. Because even to write down what happens to hydrodynamics as you go to higher and higher order in derivatives, because you can do the same thing here, as I did here in relativity, they can do that. You can do that in the non-relativistic as well. And you can write down what happens at first order, which is like never Stokes, and then which is normal and standard. And non-relativistic is a completely well-defined theory. It's fine. Then if you go to second order, there's something called Burnett equations. And those equations already have an issue. They're unstable. Um, you can go to something else called super brunette. Um, and I don't think the problems get better. And in fact, just to actually write down the equations, it's very, very, very hard because everything depends on everything else. Um, and you can think about it like this. Like, think about the Knudsen number as like a, like a coupling constant in the sense that the theory in equilibrium, the Knudsen number is zero. And then you're trying to do a perturbative expansion around you know, this free theory, which is equilibrium. So the first order term is never Stokes or you know, something like that that I showed here in relativity. And then there's a second order, third order, et cetera. The problem is it's, it's um, imagine that the, you're doing this quantum field theory, but the coupling itself depends on the fields. It becomes very complicated because the Knudsen number is the gradient of the fields. And then you have to expand it itself. So it's, it's, it gets complicated. So in is general- Is there a in running of a coupling in a quantum field theory? Um, it's, or qualitatively is, it is the same. Qualitatively is the same. The difference is that you have many Knudsen numbers. You have one for shear, one for bulk, one for diffusion, one for something else. So it's like trying to do that in a quantum field theory with many couplings. As we know, this is hard, very hard. Um, but in relativity, if you have a system that's expanding very fast and you can do it relativistically, there are two examples that we can understand. The first one and that one and those two, we can actually do a lot of stuff. The first one is called a Bjorken expansion. And this is a system that expands in the Z direction here at the speed of light, but it doesn't move at all on the X and Y plane. Um, this thing, which is an idealization is actually relevant for heavy ions. But in that case, you can write down the Knudsen number expansion to all orders in simple systems. Um, and then you can see what happens to the series. Another one that is actually pretty interesting is also involves relativity is if you have a system or a universe that is expanding uh, uh, in terms of a FRW expansion, just a normal expansion of the universe. Because in this case, the universe is homogeneous, is isotropic, but it's, you know, the whole thing is expanding. In the sense, there are many, many symmetries. The system is easy. The Knudsen number is easy to, take, to keep track of, and you can do the calculation. So here is an example where we can actually write down every single term that appears in the series, and we can prove, even analytically, that the series diverges. Um, but this case was done in an FRW system. So in, in all these cases, relativity has been important. 
It will be interesting if you can do that in a normal relativistic system, and we should really go for a system that is normal relativistic but has nice symmetries, like some Schrodinger invariance or something like that, that you can still write down, um, somehow imagine that you are able to write down what the flow velocity is just from symmetries and the system is expanding fast. Uh, they, that's basically what happened here. The symmetries mm -hmm. already gave me the flow velocity. So the hard part was already out. So I just have to solve a little thing. I see. So it'll be very interesting, extremely interesting, I would say. Um, and um, to, to see that type of stuff um, in other fields like cold atoms, but you would have to find a type of flow where you can actually keep track and do these type of calculations order by order in a systematic manner. This is very hard without symmetries, but you know, maybe it could be invented. All right. Any final questions? If not, let's uh, thank Jorge for a nice talk. Okay. Oh, here we go. Okay. Is it possible that uh, that could you share these slides, uh, perhaps? No, oh, sure, sure. I can send it to Michael. Thank you. Okay, and I'll post. Sure, sure. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll formally 